Did you know that just like we have today the fashion subcultures of dark academia and cottagecore, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, we had reform dress and aesthetic dress. Hello and welcome, I'm Maria from Sew Through Time, and this time we're taking a quick look at aesthetic and reform dress, what they were, and we're going to make an aesthetic dress from the Edwardian era. So aesthetic dress, reform dress, and the suffragette movement are all intertwined and interconnected. And they start in about the mid-19th century. At this point in the uh, mid-19th century, really large skirts, very tightly fitted bodices, and corsets were in fashion. And the reform dress movement kind of happens as a kind of like counter movement to that. So the idea in reform dress was that instead of wearing these multiple layers of different clothing, that you would wear less layers and the clothing would be less restrictive and allowing you to work, work and move better in the world, even as an upper class lady who still needed to be fashionable and rejecting the like traditional values of fashion and womanhood. They spoke very loudly against crinolines and bustles and big hoop skirts. They, the idea was that you would have, yes, a skirt still, but you would wear it most often with bloomers. And the bloomer fashion was a huge part of the reform dress movement. Then it later evolved to just be more loose garments in general that were kind of in the fashionable shapes. They did keep up with the fashionable shapes just with less extreme silhouettes and much softer lines. And a big part of that idea was that you wouldn't necessarily wear a corset. But that doesn't mean that they didn't actually wear a corset, like, or a thing that we would consider nowadays a corset. It was just that they considered tight lacing especially, but very restrictive garments in general, a bad thing. So the underwear was less restrictive. The underwear was a lot of knits. The union suit came out of the dress reform. And also looser garments in general, especially different kinds of wrappers and wrapping gowns became hugely fashionable because of the reform dress movement. And not wearing corsets, that was a part of the dre uh, reform dress movement, very rarely actually meant that you wouldn't wear any sort of garment, supportive undergarment. It just meant that you wouldn't necessarily wear a heavily boned garment made out of cotille and with a heavy like steel busk and that sort of things. Those reform corsets or reform waists were often much lighter boned, often boned just with cording, and they were meant to just hold your body instead of really necessarily compress. But because the main purpose of a corset, I have a separate video on that where I go into more details and I go through the history of the corset, but the main point of a corset is not actually to necessarily restrict your body, it is to sculpt your body and to hold your skirts. Because when you put multiple layers of waistbands on your waist, that can ca cause a pressure point that can actually be really uncomfortable. So no, the reform dress movement didn't go away with it. Like they didn't take away the corset. They still wanted some sort of supportive undergarment. They just renamed it reform waists, bust supporters, and different kinds of things like this instead of the corset. And with this rejection of that traditional like tightly fitted bodice and tightly fitted garment idea. Of course, when you got rid of that really tight, rigid corset underneath and did for a less restrictive item, then the outer silhouette also needed to be less restrictive because one important part, and especially if you went completely without a corset, because one important thing about a corset is that because it keeps your measurements exactly the same, the movement that comes from breathing and just, you know, it, it, as your stomach expands, as you sit down or just move around, that is all like accommodated inside the corset that happens all inside there. So you can fit the bodice extremely tightly over the corset because that does, your measurements don't change. And a big idea of the dress reform was that the garments looked too restrictive when they were tightly fitted against the body. So that they, the idea was that you would give more movement and freedom visually to the body by looser garments and therefore implying 
more freedom for the actual woman inside. Around the same time period, there was also a huge shift in art and especially there was a lot of different art movements going on and one very big movement was the pre-Raphaelite movement where the idea was to get reject the teachers, uh, teachings of the masters of the Renaissance period, like Michelangelo and Raphael, instead going back to the more medieval, more naturalistic style, where a big part of that style, of course, was loose, flowy hair and sort of medieval-ish overgarments. And as these pre-Raphaelites did these paintings, they also, of course, dressed their models in that sort of fashion. So even though the garments were very much 19th century garments, they were very strongly influenced and inspired by the medieval era. So these women, these models, the, their wives started actually wearing this fashion and that became artistic dress. It is very much related to the same like free flowy fabric idea that was often a theme in reform dress, but it's a separate th thing because it was very much tied to the aesthetic look of it rather than the functionality and women's rights aspect of it. And one big reason why these worlds were so intertwined and the fashion was so intertwined with the reform dress movement and the artistic dress movement is because the art world in general tends to be very progressive and these progressive ideas of women's rights were of course a very important part of the same circles that these artists that did the pre-Raphaelite movement would have been privy to and a part of. Usually these garments can't be separated by the fact that reform dress most often is more about function and the aesthetic dress and art or artistic dress is more about the pre-Raphaelite notions of fashion, but they do very much interlap. And a lot of times, especially when we get to the turn of the 19th and 20th century, they interlap so much that it's very hard to see, like recognize what's the difference between an artistic dress or a reform dress. And they tend to basically often wear the same sort of undergarments and hold the same place in society and the same people would often wear them. But while split skirts and bloomers were an intricate part of reform dress, they weren't really a part of artistic dress so much because artistic dress was, again, medieval inspired, so it was mostly long flowy gowns. But that was also a part of reform dress, so there is a lot of overlap, especially later on. And the dress we're making today is definitely a very strongly pre-Raphaelite inspired artistic dress, though it could be worn also for reform fashion. And because this garment is so heavily inspired by the medieval era, it is patterned exactly like a medieval garment, just looser. So the pattern pieces all consist of rectangles and triangles. I'll have a printout for the instructions down below in the link if you want. But basically this garment is just patterned by taking the bodice measurement. You want to measure from your shoulder all the way to the floor or on top of your foot, depending on where you want it to end. And then you double that because the garment does not have a seam here at the shoulder line. So you double that for length. And then the width of the rectangle you get by taking the, your measuring tape and measuring the widest part of you. For me, that is 41 inches. And then we round that to the lower, uh, down to the next full number. So that would be 40. And we round it down instead of up simply because this is a loose garment, it's gonna be loose, so it doesn't matter. Then we divide that in two, so we get 20. And 20 is the width of the garment without any ease. But then of course we add ease. You wanna add at least six to eight inches. I added eight inches. So then the width of the rectangle is 28 inches for me. And because of my height, I'm 5'4", it ended up being 56 inches. I roll out the fabric to the height of the body piece and mark that and then 
fold the fabric to that length and then roll it back down. And mark the correct width of the body. And because I decided to line my dress, I do the same for the lining. And then with the shoulder fold in place, I fold the fabric over widthwise and cut out approximation of the neckline. This doesn't have to be precise, you can fit it on later on your body. Just big enough for your head to slip through. Then to add fullness on the hem and make the garment hang better, you would insert triangles at the side, just like in medieval garments. For my height, I wanted them 33 inches. It doesn't exactly matter where the triangle ends, as long as it comes at least to your waist. It can come all the way to your armpit, but that is gonna add a lot of extra fabric to the upper body. So I personally prefer to end it somewhere about waist-ish, maybe a little bit below your waist, maybe a little bit above, it doesn't really matter. So I went with 33 inches for my length, and then you want the gores to be 13 inches wide. This basically works for most body types. If you are much bigger than my 42 inches at your widest part, then you could go an inch or two bigger, but you don't really want to go much bigger than that because then it will add too much fullness to the bottom of the garment. And you cut four of these side gores because you want one for the front and one for the back on each side. The on-grain edges of the two gores get sewn together to form the triangles that get inserted on each side. Then pin the triangles to the front and back body pieces of the dress, starting at the bottom. And then sew them on. Then the sleeve consists of two pieces. You have one rectangle that is the length of the sleeve, folded, there is no top seam or there's only the bottom seam, kind of the bottom seam. And then there is another, this one piece is a square that you will insert so that it is diagonally so that it ends up being like a diamond shape underneath so that will be not only your gusset or under or gore for your armpit area to give you that freedom of movement but also it will be a hangy bit that kind of creates that medieval vibe for your sleeve so for the actual rectangle that creates the like actual sleeve I went with 12 inches long. You can, if you are much taller than me, I'm 5'4", you can go longer, but it doesn't necessarily need to be longer than that because again, the sleeve is not fitted. It's not supposed to be full length, especially on top because you have that huge gore on the bottom. So it's easier to move if it isn't full length, but you wanna keep in mind that if you do lengthen this, from the 12 inches, then you need to also lengthen the square piece that goes that is inserted in that. You want to keep that two inches bigger than the length of your sleeve. So since I went with 12, my rectang uh, my square is 14 inches. And then for the width, because we want to make sure that it's not a tight or a fitted sleeve, so just measure loosely around your arm and for me that like this bit like it's not super loose but it's a little loose is 14 inches so that's what i went with and again this doesn't have to be precise because you have that diamond shaped gore in there it will give you room it won't make the sleeve tight anyways so just go with an approximation Then 
whether or not you choose to line the garment, the sleeve pieces will still need a lining piece cut out to hide the seam allowance. Then pin the sleeve piece and the sleeve gore together, making sure that the sleeve gore ends up diagonally on the sleeve. Then sew the fashion fabric and lining fabric sleeves separately. And then with the right size facing each other, Insert the fashion fabric sleeve and the lining fabric sleeve together by pinning and then sewing the bottom edges together. Then clip the tip of the sleeve gore and then turn the sleeve the right way around. and then insert the sleeve onto the main body of the dress. Now here's where I made a stupid mistake. I inserted the sleeve into the bodice through both the fashion fabric and the lining. But if you're lining the bodice, the best idea is to leave the lining off from this and insert the sleeve only to the fashion fabric and then hand sew that lining piece onto the sleeve on top so that you cover all the raw edges. Then sew on the sleeve and the remaining side seam before the gore. Hem the garment by folding both the fashion fabric and lining fabric together twice over. And sew. For period accurate hem protection, you can add a strip of velvet or a brush braid. With this basic bat pattern, you can make several different kinds of reform dresses or aesthetic dresses. You can play around a lot with details like necklines and especially trimmings. You can add trimmings to the shoulders, just the neckline or down the front. You can embroider things. You can add all kinds of fancy details on the sleeves. You can go as wild as you want with this pattern. And as for wearing this garment, you can wear it belted or non-belted. It can be worn without a corset with modern undergarments or with historical undergarments, either a reformed corset or just a regular old, old corset. Because I was using a painted silk, I decided to go fairly simple and just trim the neckline with bias binding made out of the same material as the sleeve lining. If you decide to use this pattern to create your own pre-Raphaelite dream dress, please tag me in the pictures because I'd love to see. I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, please hit that like button because it really does help out in this world. And if you haven't already subscribed and you like to do that, go ahead and do that so that I can see you again next time. Bye!